some well is giving this one because he's going to tell you what we what we've been doing on our own with our collaborators. Sounds great. Thank you, everybody who came to the presentation today. Um, I I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Koch, uh, Bart, and Dr. Bo for the invitation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about bacterial blotch of mushroom, the importance of know your enemy before you go to war. Um, here is a picture showing a mushroom farm. And that's how the growers um, produce mushrooms. It's inside of a house, and they grow them in beds. Usually, we have more than one lab of beds, and they use compost to um, produce mushrooms. Um, I, at Penn State, I've been engaged in so many projects. One of them is mushroom, and partially because Pennsylvania produces uh, approximately 60% of the mushroom uh, in the entire country. And this is how a mushroom should look um, healthy and pretty. However, we have uh, the main disease of mushroom. One of them are bacterial blotch, which is caused by a complex of pseudomonas. Um, and where the pathogen can come from. So there's different sources of inoculum. So it can come from, from the compost. This is a paper, a survey paper that we published uh, last month. You can take a look for more detail if you're interested in. Um, so if the compost is not sterilized properly, it can carry the pathogen to the farms, to the house. Um, and it also can be uh, another source of the pathogen. It's the spawn, like, if you make an analogy for seeds or seedlings, you're gonna grow a crop. You wanna make sure to, be, to get a seedling or a seed a healthy, just like a spawn, right? That carries the mushroom cellum. And another source is the casing or all those raw material that the grower add to the, the compost um, that can also carry the pathogen. And once the pathogen inside the house, uh, the microbe can move from a contaminated mushroom to a healthy one, of course, spreading the disease. So one of the reasons that the mushroom is very susceptible to bacteria is because it's a, uh, the mushroom itself is a very ideal environment to microbial growth and proliferation. Uh, we do a lot of pathogenicity tests because we study the pathogen. And for example, if we add 10 um, micromolars of, of bacteria, um, solution that carries the pathogen within 15 hours you can do see a reaction like that it's really fast and one of the reasons is because mushroom has a high moisture content and a water to close to one which is the maximum in a pH around neutral that fav favorable the bacterial proliferation bacterial blotch as you can see in the image here the symptom it's like showing um, a little bit of uh, browning and also some peating, as you can see in this particular mushroom. It's been estimated that the loss caused by this pathogen uh, are around 10 to 15 percent worldwide, and the main cause uh, cause of agent is Pseudomonas thalassi. However, recently other researchers have shown that other pathogens, such as Pseudomonas uh, garrisi, Constantini, and Pseudomonas protogen can also cause blood uh, in mushrooms. So the virulence factors that play a role in uh, the mushroom, uh, in the blotch disease, it's the tolacin. We're talking here in, about Pseudomonas tolacin, of course. So it causes some transmembrane pores in the surface of the mushroom. And some researchers have knocked out the, the gene related to the tolacin and so on drastic reduction of the disease uh, severity. So one, we can use that information, for example, to detect the pathogen by uh, looking for primers specific to amplify that region. And we already have primers designed for that. Another way to detect uh, Pseudomonas tolassi, which is the main pathogen that causes blotch, is through this assay, which is called white line reaction assay. So basically, these are the species of Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas, thalass, uh, Pseudomonas protogen, PF5, uh, fluorescence, and Pulida produces all the lipopeptide, white line, white line inducer principle. 
And this white line with the suprinsitol, when it interacts, when it interacts with the glassin, which is another lipopeptide, it produces this white line in between, due to, to this interaction. So as you can see in this plate here, you have in orange different three different strains of Pseudomonas thalassi that formed the white line, and here are the Pseudomonas that did not form thalassi. So it's a practical way to detect Pseudomonas um, thalassi. And that's the reason that's uh, why these species are called Pseudomonas reactants. However, Pseudomonas reactant is not a valid taxonomic name. And speak of valid taxonomic name, not a long time ago, uh, the name of Pseudomonas was very problematic. But now we already have it really, really defined. For example, in this website, list of prokaryote names with standing uh, in nomenclature, you can find all the type strain of any other organism that you want to work on. Um, in addition to that, we already have all the whole genome sequence of a lot of different pseudomonas in the public database, such as JGI and CBI. And authors, uh, researchers such as, for example, Hasey and collaborators, they did a comparison with all the pseudomonas, not only type strain, but all the no unnamed pseudomonas and group them in clicks based on the average nucleotide identity and also the alignment fraction of the, the genes, these predicted genes. And they use this threshold to classify them in clicks, group of clicks. Okay, so if you look on the other side of the coin, we have different Beneficial pseudomonas are also associated with mushroom. In fact, most of them are beneficial. Only few are pathogenic. Um, and in fact, some of them actually, it's not only, uh, they help the mushroom to uh, develop. For example, pseudomonas polida, they are actually required in the initial states of being to help the uh, mushroom development. And others have shown to control blood disease. So that's very important when you're thinking about managing the, the disease, you're only targeting those pathogen and not, non, and not the beneficial microbes. So it's important to know your enemy before you go to war. War, you don't want to kill your ally, right? So just to put it into perspective, Galileo Galileo, among the many contributions he did for science, he invented the telescope. So Galileo put together two lenses in a particular distance, and allows this instrument to see eight times bigger than our naked eye. But before Galileo pointed this instrument to the sky and re revolutionized the astronomy, this instrument was actually used for military purpose. So the Italian Navy Army, for example, they used this instrument to spy the align from the distance. So they, that gave the uh, Italian Army advantage against the enemy because they could see them before the enemy see them. Here at Penn State, of course, in the Department of Plant Pathology and Environmental Microbiology, we don't work with telescope, but instead we have a set of tools that allows us to identify the pathogen, to detect the pathogen once we identify them, and also to use that information to manage control plant disease, only target the pathogen, not the beneficial microbes. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about in this presentation. And the first research I'd like to talk to you about Okay, is this one, it's a survey that uh, was actually started with Dr. Laura Rams Sepulveda. So she went to five different uh, mushroom farms in uh, Pennsylvania and collect different mushrooms with blood disease, isolate the bacteria, and we, we narrowed down the number of isolates by looking at their fingerprint based on the rep PCR because we are talking about hundreds of isolates here. And we did some pathogenicity tests. We discard those who did not cause disease, of course. And we studied some phenotypic, uh, we did some phenotypic assay with the isolates, for example, white line reaction assay. And I put together here a database of 1400 genes, of housekeeping genes uh, from public database of that belongs to 188 clicks and 162 type strain of pseudomonas that allowed me to, that allowed us to do a multi sequence analysis. Oops, go back. Okay. 
So here's the tree. So it's really small, of course, I'm gonna zoom in. But before I show the tree, I just wanna show you the genetic gist that I use to identify the species, uh, which is 0 0.0375. So Dr. Bowen collaborators published this paper and what they did, they did a correlation between DNA-DNA hybridization of a cutoff point of 7% between species. And because this technique is really expensive, it's hard to perform. So they did this correlation and found that for the 7%, it corresponds to that value that I told you about to do a, a multi local sequence analysis. Okay, go to next. So here's a tree. It's still a little small, but I'm going to zoom in. And first, I can tell you that we found 14 different species of pseudomonas that cause blood disease. This species was distributed in eight clades and six single clades. Among all the clades, the clade five was the biggest one in terms of number of isolates um, because it, it also belonged to the clade of Pseudomonas thalassae because it grouped together with this type strain. Um, these numbers between parentheses in black represent the number of uh, Rep PCR representatives, for example, BP1106 have the same rep. There's 27 other isolates that have the same rep PCR. In addition to that, only this group from clade five showing, uh, showed a white line reaction positive result and also amplification for the thalassin gene. Okay, so here is the result for that. So in the bottom of this slide, I have a gel showing the thalassin, amplification of the thalassin gene. As you can see here, only clade five showed this amplification in addition to the positive control. And on the top of the slide, you can see different strain tested for the white line reaction. All of those isolates in orange are those from the clade five and show the white line reaction in addition to the positive control. Okay. Okay, <laughs> we get in there. In addition to that, we found another strain that grouped together with not no uh, pseudomonas pathogen, which is pseudomonas agaricae that causes blood disease. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, in addition to that, we found other clades that did not group with anything else, but it grouped with some clicks. So now, now that organism that I just showed you, it's not a type strain, but we can go back in the literature and see where that, where that isolate was, uh, came from and who worked with that isolate and perhaps ask the authors to send us the strain and we can work with that and ask more questions. In addition to that, in a single mushroom, we found more than one strain of the same, same species. For example, clade five here, we found different strains of Pseudomonas thalassi. Sometimes we saw different species infecting the same mushroom, and even three species. Here, I'm showing you one species from clade five, another one from clade seven, and one from single thrum, single thrum five. So in summary, we, isol we did uh, a survey, isolate bacteria from five survey, five, uh, five mushroom farms. We narrowed down the number of isolates by growing them in keep the media, doing pathogenicity tests and rep PCR, and conducted a multi -lobe sequence analysis using these four housekeeping genes. And we came up with 50 strains. This 50 strains was grouped in six uh, single, single tongue plates uh, all of them did not group with any type strain. They're unknowns and potentially could be new species. And eight clades, one of them grouped together with, one strain grouped together with agaricine and a lot grouped together with Pseudomonas thalassi. 
but we still have six other clades that are unknown and potentially could be new species. Okay, so now with that information, we can use that to target uh, those specific strains and use that to control the disease. For example, we can isolate bacterial fires to control specific strains because fires are very specific in controlling bacteria. If we control, for example, isolate uh, fires to control clade five or specific strain, it's not going to manage the disease because we know, we know why there's more than one strain. But we can create a cocktail instead and depending on the strain that we identify there, we can use specific part. Next. In fact, there's a postdoc come to our lab to work specifically on this project. Sorry, I don't understand why it's taking forever. All right. So let's move on. So I showed you, but we use the bacteriophage, but we can also use different other tools. For example, Dr. Bo and I wrote a grant for George Mushroom uh, Company, and we got funded, and now we are studying a uh, representative of each one of these clades. We sequence the whole genome, and we are looking for virulence inspectors. Um, I'm not showing you a lot of detail about this project, because I'm not going to publish soon. However, what I can tell you from now is that uh, after I assembled the genome, I saw a correlation between taxonomic and the type of virulence factors that those strains are producing. For example, so the, the tolacin was only present in the clade 5. So this, with this information, we can, for example, design specific primers to detect specific pathogen. And now so we can possibly use food additives. So this group of research from Korea, two, two years ago, they um, used different tolacin inhibitors inhibitory factors, or TIF, and for two of them, they found a good result in terms of inhibiting the tolacin. And I looked it up for this uh, food additive of mine, and I found that this is present in our food. For example, this first one, they use in chocolate, so it's totally fine if you use that in a mushroom. Okay, so I talk to you about bacterial fires to control blood disease and also some food additives. Um, but we can also use beneficial microbes to control uh, blood disease, right? And in this research, we did a study on the microbiome from symptomatic and asymptomatic mushroom to look for the difference between the bacterial community of these two environment. And we also were interested to look for the methods where we're gonna extract this bacteria from the surface or from the interior of mushroom. And this project actually was started by Dr. Bell. So he got a grant um, from the Schreier Institute of Teaching Excellence. And we, because of that, we conducted this research with the help of a lot of students. Most of them are here, actually. And this project was also led by Dr. Bull, Dr. Peckin, and Dr. Hockett. So we went to our organic farm in Pennsylvania, collected, we collected 25 mushroom, asymptomatic mushroom and 25 symptomatic. We sonicated them and collected the bacterial DNA from the surface. And we call this method Boche. Then we macerate the mushroom, those same mushroom, and then we collect the bacteria from the interior of the mushroom. And we call that method Boche. Boche. And we did the same thing with additional other people, mush, uh, mushroom. However, we did not sonicate it. We just macerate them and collect all the bacterial DNA. And we call that map home method. Okay, so here's the first figure showing uh, NMDS. And as you can see, there's a kind of separation from red and blue. Red represent all those OTUs coming from symptomatic mushroom. And in cyan, represent those uh, OTUs coming from asymptomatic mushroom. In addition to that, we found a statistical difference for the methods, not only for health, but not for the interaction between them. And regardless of the methods and the health status, we found that proteobacteria and bacterial dates was the two phyla that were more abundant in the mushroom.
Okay, so here I'm showing you a taxonomic heat tree. So in this tree, we are comparing um, asymptomatic with symptomatic mushrooms for all the methods combined. So from the center, you see this node, which is bacteria representing the domain. And if you move from the center to the, the border, you're going to reach the uh, family level, which is the last taxonomic level that we analyze in this, uh, in this uh, figure. So as you can see, most of the nodes are gray, representing, showing, um, meaning that there was no difference between uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic in terms of numbers of OTUs. We found nine taxa that were more abundant in symptomatic mushroom, but we found 33 taxa that, taxa that were more abundant in asymptomatic mushroom. So we hypothesized that those taxa could have beneficial microbe that we could isolate to test it against blood disease. In fact, we have all those microorganisms stored in glycerol stock, in glycerol stock in our lab, so we can go back and isolate them. As an example, we also found in the literature that organisms belonging to these two orders, Bacillalis and Xenthomonatalis, have organisms that can control blood disease. So we could potentially start from there. Talking about diversity, we assess these three diversity parameters, uh, channel diversity, richness, and evenness. And talking about uh, asymptomatic and symptomatic OTUs first, we found a higher abundance for asymptomatic compared to symptomatic for all of them. And when we analyzed only the, uh, the methods, we didn't find any difference for the richness, but we found a difference for evenness. We found a lower evenness for whole mushroom compared to was washate and washate. And because channel diversity takes in consideration richness and evenness, we also found a higher uh, value for wash shade and pause wash shade for channel diversity. Okay, because the wash shade and pause wash shade represent the whole mushroom, so we want to compare here in this figure the difference between these two uh, methods. Um, and when it, everything here in brown represents those OTUs that came from the surface of mushroom, and everything in green represents all those OTUs that came from the interior. As you can see, regardless of the health status, symptomatic or asymptomatic, mm -hmm. we have more greens um, nodes compared to the brown. What does that mean? That means that if you want to go back and look for beneficial microbials, we're going to try to isolate them from the interior. But it depends. If you are looking specifically for uh, specific taxa, for example, symptomatic uh, pseudomonas, we are more likely to find them in the wash shade because this is specific text that were more abundant in the wash shade mushroom, right? Okay, so we also analyzed specifically PSVs or exactly secret variants. Uh, we found 53 that correspond specifically to pseudomonas and we compared these ESVs with type strains, clicks, and some bacteria that we isolate from mushroom and we have proved to be pathogenic. As you can see here in this phylogenetic tree, everything blue, it's really distributed throughout the tree, meaning that there is a big diversity of uh, ESCBs coming from OTUs that are related to pseudomonas. Some of them uh, are close to path no pathogen, type strain of pathogens, everything showing asterisks here, so we potentially don't want to isolate them want something distant from the pathogens. Okay, so a takeaway message from um, th this presentation is that bacterial blocks are caused by different species of pseudomonas. We found in the survey paper, survey uh, study research, we did 14 different species. Uh, some of these species are causing disease in the same mushroom. For example, two species are co-infected the same mushroom and sometimes even three. So the monostolacy was the most dominant mushroom causing pathogen. With this information, we can use to control specific species or even strain of uh, pseudomonas using bacteriophage, virulence factors, 
uh, by studying the whole genome sequence and use that information also to help in the uh, detection by design specific primaries. There are different in the mushroom regarding the health, symptomatic and asymptomatic, and also regards the method. So now we know exactly what we're going to look for for potential beneficial microbes. And there are 33 taxes that possibly can be investigated for potential biological control agents. With that, I would like, I would like to thank the, my lab members, in particular, Dr. Bo, who is my advisor. Um, it's been amazing to work with her and all, all other collaborators that um, helped in this paper. Thank you, and I'd like to take some questions. Can you explain the difference between a click and a clade? Click and a clade. Okay, so clade, we use a uh, genetic distance of that I showed you in the paper, 0.035, right? To, uh, and that I, I use that genetic distance in the most local sequence amount using four house genomes. For the click, they use the whole genome sequence. Uh, using uh, A and I and AF, average nucleotide identity and fragmento uh, something. And they use a difference cutoff using a really high pool of uh, genes, not only four. Mm -hmm. So it's the same, <clears throat> but for a different method. Right. Yeah. They're both similar to the mm -hmm. So the idea is that you a click is a hundred species that was identified. So in pseudomonas, there's 166 or whatever it is. Um, clicks. No, 160 new species that are type strain. And then there, they compared those to all of the, the genomes of all of the data in the in databases. And they came up with 188 other things that are distant enough in pseudomonas to be species. So when, when we do this, we really look at, is it has it been identified as a click unnamed species, or has it been named, is it identified as a named species? So both of those things serve as a framework for creating a taxonomy for whatever we work with in pseudomonas. And all of them have benefits. Not, but if you use your clicks, possibly, going to be more expensive, you have isolate because you have to do a whole genome sequence. <coughs> you have to use more of different genes. If you're doing an assay, you can work with less genes. Mm -hmm. No, you, you, you took all of those whole genomes and got the MLSA genes out of them so we can do MLSA with clicks, right? Yeah, but I have to compare my isolates with them. Right? So in order to do that, I need to sequence my whole genome sequence. Instead, okay. <laughs> we can talk a little bit. Maybe, maybe for some things. Yeah. Yes, for some things. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for asking the question. Absolutely. Thank you for your presentation. It was really nice. Um, it's kind of a reviewer question. So, in your microbiome analysis, when you see a difference between asymptomatic and symptomatic, is that a cause or a consequence? In other words, is the microbiome of asymptomatic cause the disease to not establish? Or is that when you have an infection, then you change the microbiome and then you see an effect? So it's a consequence of the disease. That's a good question. And um, it's still a hypothesis that we would have to test. It's hard to tell. Does anybody else have an idea? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Just a follow-up question to that. I was thinking the same thing because we have seen those things. Whatever, uh, whatever the pathogenic pseudomonas, is it competing with those non-symptomatic strain, or if that is a, there is a vacant niche before the pathogenic the, uh, strain was there? I'm trying to, uh, because um, I've I've noticed some sort of thing, same kind of things in the back microbiomes on the their uh, back street like that. Um, I see a lot of uh, 
a fungal pathogen is going to if there is a no symptom or pathogenic fungi. And, but uh, when there is a pathogenic fungi, it's almost like almost the only that strong. So I'm thinking like it may be that somehow the leaves are so hard that that's a bad I was wondering like what is my be the reason about the natural I don't know. I mean, I have to prove that thing was that maybe some kind of a computation ESA in the lab or something. But I think in this system, compared to something like that, it would be very easy to test because you just take a blotch mushroom and sort of insert it in the middle of non black lens and search and survey over the course of time or something like that. Maybe you can follow that. The, uh, in, in your data set, too, there are actually a lot of lines that were showing up as. Um, pathogenic that we didn't have visible symptoms yet too. So it, it does seem like it's a slight early detection maybe in mm -hmm. this is still this is a very answer to the question. So if you can go back to the ESVs, can you go back to that slide? So do you know which of these ones that are showing up as pathogens? So for example, if you look at the Pseudomonas agarisi group. Yeah, that group there, there's a lot of the blue that are ESVs for mushrooms. Do we know, are those all from symptomatic or asymptomatic? So if they're asymptomatic, the pathogens there. It's hard to just see. I don't know, I don't know if you would know that from yeah, your data. I, I have that information here. Um, oh, yeah. They, they are. Yeah, they are distributed uh, equally, so. Okay, so they show up on both. Both, correct. Okay. So what, what did, what, so the ones that are blue or red are showing up. Correct. Differently. Mm -hmm. It's more abundant in one on another. And so it's none of the pathogens that are distributed differently. Time course would be interesting. I think also, like, it's a good system for sort of swapping, kind of finding microbiomes because you can easily go along the surface and introduce different. So, if you have a good selection, just say you're the same over here, one that potentially beneficial or not, could kind of easily do that and manage it as well. Yeah, because that just raised a bit of a question because you see quite a bit. Of microbial diversity inside. Yes. So, so when you do, do that, is it you're doing that washing procedure? Well, we don't really know if it's inside. Yes, so that's what I'm it's, getting at. It's, it, it's, it's more tightly attached. adhered to yeah. the surface. That's okay. a whole other question. Yeah, so I, I, I was curious about that. It's to like you kind of take the whole mushroom and chew it up, but it, you just took like the first like a couple millimeters or something like that. Get all of that in the same result. Yeah. Yes. She's great on this treatment. Yeah, something like that. Very tall. And you know, mushroom is infected with uh, mycoplasmas. At least one part of the virus is there. For sure. So if you take a profile of microvirus, mushroom, they could find the relationship between that profile and uh, bacterial disease. As we plan to check the factor detection, maybe it would be useful to take a look of these simians. So they would be all in one environment. That's a really good idea. That's a good point. It's even a better idea because this is a plug. We have someone who studies virals coming in and is going to be doing a workshop. So sign up for that workshop. Places are going fast. That's awesome. It's part of the reason we do these weekly meetings right here. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs>